Right now, as I said before, I'm trying to build myself back up. And I have the privilege to have another one of my spiritual sons. God has blessed me. God has blessed me over the years to be able to minister to other young ministers. You know, men who I see who have a, a heart for God. Men who I see who have a love for God. You know, when I see that, it's like, man, let me, let me throw a little fuel on that fire so that flame can burn brighter. So we have a uh, guy today who came in who was a part of the ministry. You know, he was just a regular congregant. Then he became a deacon. Then he became an elder. And now he is a pastor. Yes, yes. So if you guys will, welcome Pastor Dwayne Roberts from Calvary Chapel of Boynton Beach. Thank you, my brother. Again, it is good to uh, have him here. I think when I first uh, met him, I think he had, what, one child? Yes. And now he has how many? Three. Three. And the oldest one is bigger than all of us. Yes. And uh, when we said, hey, son, <laughs> how you doing, son? So we've been doing life together for uh, a number of years. And again, I'm just so happy to have you here. God bless you. Yeah, it's my honor. It's my honor. Let's give it up for Pastor Darrell. And you might be wondering why I brought two jackets up here. It's not because I'm cold. It's, the, it's part of the, the message. Um, I, I would say also um, that, that I cut my teeth in sharing God's word in this house. And I'll say the only reason why I'm able to, to share God's word with the passion that he's given me is because of men like Pastor Darrell. So brother, my spiritual father, I stand on your shoulders today as I preach the word of God. Amen. So we're going to be continuing in the book of Philippians chapter 2. And, and here's what I want to do at, at Boynton. Um, it had to be a couple of months ago. I felt like the Lord was saying to me, every time that we read his word, we are supposed to stand. And so if you don't mind, if you have the ability to, would you stand with me as I read God's word? We're going to pray it out. And the reason why God had me stand was because in the, in the book of Nehemiah in chapter 8, when they had rebuilt the wall, it said the people stood for the reading of God's word and then revival broke out. And we've been praying for revival. Now, they stood for four hours. I'm not going to make you stand for four hours. Maybe two hours. I'm just kidding. But let's read the first two verses of Philippians chapter 2, verse 1. It says, therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your presence. God, we are humbled that you would call us sons and daughters. God, I'm reminded of the time when we weren't even looking for you to be our father. As Pastor Darrell said, we were in a thousand other places. But God, we've come to your house to hear not from a man, but from God. And so Jesus, meet us. Meet us where we are in our thoughts. God, meet us where we are in our hearts. God, meet us where we are in our deepest places. God, we pray that you would touch us afresh. God, would you blow fresh wind and fresh fire through this house, God? God, we expect you to do something. And God, as I pray, I, I always say I am a speaker, but I am also a receiver. Jesus, help me to be sensitive to the way your Holy Spirit wants to weave through these notes and weave through this word. And collectively, we pray like John, may we all decrease 
so you can increase. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. And so um, I say this all the time at Calvary Chapel, Boynton Beach. If, if, if I say something that's worth an amen, please say the amen. Don't think that because I'm a guest speaker. I, I love when people get excited about God's word. Amen? amen. I just want to make sure you are with me. So today's title, we're going to be talking about imitating Christ's humility. And I remember last week I was praying and, and just getting ready for service. And, and the Lord was telling me, get over yourself. I think sometimes when we think about humility, it's about how do we get over ourselves? And I'm going to ask you a question. And I want you to reflect on this question that I believe the Lord maybe challenges us and may challenge you today is, do you consider yourself a humble person? Now, that's a tricky question, because if you say, I am humble, that can almost sound prideful. And if you say, I am a person that sometimes struggle with pride, you would quickly raise your hand. But do you consider yourself a humble person? I'm not necessarily asking you to answer that question, but today we're going to learn what it means to have the humility of Christ. In John 17 and 22 and 23, it says this, I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one, I in them and you in me, so that they may be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. I love this picture when, John, when Jesus is praying his high priestly prayer. The one thing that you never see in the Trinity is an argument. Everybody knows their role, but there's always complete unity. And what is Jesus saying? When we reflect the unity that the Trinity reflects, the world may know that Jesus was sent through us. And so how does the world know Jesus is unity in the church? But the Apostle Paul is saying to us today, what is the key to staying united in the church? It is humility in the church. And so as he says in verse 1 of chapter 2, he says, therefore, and we know that word therefore is there for a reason. Last week, Pastor Darrell talked about standing firm in the faith, not being frightened as one man for the gospel. I'm sorry, I get excited. So if I cause a little bit of feedback, just, just stay with me. To stand firm in the gospel. And he starts with, a, with these if statements. If you have any encouragement with, from being united to Christ, any comfort from his love, any calming and sharing in the spirit, any tenderness and compassion to make my joy complete. These if statements get you to reflect. Do I have these qualities? Do I have the quality of encouragement? And if you look up that word in the original language, it's the word paraclesis. It's the, the root word of the Holy Spirit. It means to come alongside, to inspire one with confidence. When you think about the encouragement that we need from one another, it's how do you encourage one another? It's coming alongside your brother and sister, instilling confidence back in them in who God is. Amen? We come alongside just like the Holy Spirit is with us. We talk about, Paul talks about any comfort in his love. And this word comfort means to, to lessen the intensity of a pain or distress. You gonna fix me? Okay. Comfort to lessen the intensity of someone's pain or distress. When I think about being comforted in Christ's love, I share with our congregation, I, I have done in the last year and a half more memorials than I've done weddings. And the amount of grief I see. I see people not feeling more joyful, but more in this state of grief. And having shared my own grief and losing family members, I have learned how to grieve with people. 
I've learned what it means to be comforted in his love. So Paul is asking for any encouragement, any comfort in love, any common sharing in the spirit. This word common sharing is what we know as, as koinonia. It is the fellowship of the church. So when we say do not forsake the gathering, don't get me wrong. We could gather online, but it's nothing like gathering in the house of the Lord to have that sweet fellowship. It was the, it was the early church in Acts 2 going house to house in community. The fellowship is what differentiated them from any other gathering that was going on in Jerusalem at that time. It was the, the fellowship of the saints. And he says, if you have any tenderness or compassion. Now that word goes deeper than comfort. The word tenderness and compassion means you suffer with someone. Now, this is what I love about Jesus because he suffers with us. Amen? Amen. He, he's in the suffering with us, but he's also sovereign over our suffering. And so when we suffer together, we are suffering with one another. I love it when, when Job's friends, you know the best part of Job's friends when they hung around him after he grieved? When they didn't say a word. When they just hung out with Job and sat with him for seven days. So Paul says, if we have any encouragement, any comfort, any tenderness or compassion, any common sharing in the spirit, and verse two says, make my joy complete by being like-minded with the same love, being in one spirit, one mind. What is Paul saying to us? If we have these things as part of the church, if we have these things as being individuals in Christ, then we should act out the same things that we say. Let's do these things, not say these things. So he's saying, if these things are inherited, inherit to who you are as a church, then we should act in this way. And Paul said, that will bring me joy. But you know who also it brings joy to? When we act in one mind, same spirit, same love. You know who also that brings joy to? God himself. When he sees his people acting in unity. Let's continue. I'm going to read verse 3 and 4. It says, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interest of the others. Let's stop right there. If you are a note taker, the first point of today's message is this. It's not about me, and it never should be. It's not about me. And, it's never should, and it never should be. What is Paul saying to us? Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. And he's basically saying do nothing for, for empty glory, but in humility, which is a lowliness of thinking. And who knew this better than Paul? Paul's name was Saul. His original name, Saul, meant desired. He wanted to be desired. And he changed, or I would say the Lord changed his name to Paul, which meant little. Paul realized that the only way that he was going to do anything for God was he had to become little in his own eyes. And if you're wondering what does humility mean, Timothy Keller in his book called Freedom of Self-Forgetfulness says, humility is not thinking less of yourself, it is thinking of yourself less. Let me say that again. Humility is not thinking less of yourself, so God is not calling you to call yourself or, or to be self-condemning, but it's just to think of yourself less. He says, value others. Value them for who they are. Value them because they've been created in the image of God. Also value their own, uh, value their interest above your interest. I googled um, this thought how many, how many of us, or what's the percentage of time that we actually think about ourselves and not other people? You know what that percentage is? 95% of the time, we are only thinking of ourselves. Now, I don't know about you. I used to be an engineer. You could do the math. What's 100 minus 95? 
that we're thinking about others. 5%. But maybe we should ask ourselves this question. What would the church like, what, what would the church look like if we changed that paradigm? If we flipped it and we thought 95% about others. If we took this exhortation from Paul seriously that we value others in humility, looking out for their own interests. What would the church look like if we took it seriously? What would our communities look like? If we took this seriously, well, we took the message of Jesus outside the four walls of the church to the people that need hope. What would our state look like if the church rose up and was the church and began looking at the needs of our community? What would our world look like if we took this exhortation from Paul? Individually, what would your relationship next to the person look like if you took this exhortation seriously? A couple years ago, we had a lady visit our church, and, and she was going around looking for churches where she can bring these 13 to 18-year-old girls. Now, what's special about these 13 to 18-year-old girls? Well, when, when you were seeing on the news that, that these girls and these families were trying to cross the border to find hope in the U.S., a lot of these kids were being displaced. Some of them kept at the border. Some of them shipped all over the place. Well, there was 140 girls shipped to this detention center in Lake Worth without a home. And this Christian lady, who was the director of this home, started to look for churches. She popped into Calvary Chapel, uh, Boynton Beach, and she said, I want to bring 30 to 40 girls here who have been abused, who have been trafficked, have no parents. And we began to look around, and they only speak Spanish. We looked around at our team, and we said, well, looks like maybe this is the place. And she felt like God was calling Calvary Chapel Boynton Beach to do this. Now, every week since 2019, a little pivot for COVID, 30 to 40 immigrant girls come to church, hear the gospel, and are getting saved by Jesus Christ every week. And, and, I, and I'll just say this, it doesn't matter if it's this house, Calvary Chapel, Boynton Beach, Christ Fellowship, Journey Church, it don't matter to Jesus. As long as souls are being one, it's a kingdom move. It has nothing to do. So this exhortation is not just for the church of Philippi, it's the church of today. It's a kingdom exhortation. It's something that we, we pivoted, we changed this paradigm. So Paul's encouraging them. He's giving them a charge. We know the Apostle Paul. He, he is a man who, who demands a response, but then he takes it deeper. Let's continue in chapter, I'm uh, sorry, in verse 5. It says, in your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing. By taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Point two, if you are taking note, is this. Imitating Christ's humility is a choice. It is a choice. Now, Paul is giving us the, the prescription for relationships. He says, in your relationships with one another, have this mindset that Jesus had. Have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. And as I began to study, if we all have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, there should be no churches that are divided. There should be no marriages headed for divorce if we have the same mindset 
as Jesus. There should be no bitter relationships if we have the same mindset of Jesus. Can I just say this? I have been married and, and, and I've been married a long time. But if me and my wife are approaching our relationship with the mindset of Jesus, it would have changed the dynamic. If you are, are connected to someone that you are in relationship with, if you have the same mindset as Jesus, it changes everything. And, and it's not just for those that are holy. If you have the same mindset as Jesus in your workplace, at your cubicle, as you walk through your job, side note, you are there because God put you there. Sometimes we're trying to run away from the very job that God has called us to bring others to him. So if you have the mindset of Christ as you approach your work, as you work for your boss, even as you drive through traffic on 95, if you have the mindset of Christ, you'll be praying for more people that cut you off than not. Can I say if you have the same mindset? This is not just church workplace, but also your enemies. Jesus in his beatitude said, pray for those who persecute you, who spitefully use you. If you have the mindset of Jesus, it will change. This mindset means it's, it's an attitude of heart. So Paul is saying, it is not enough for you to say that you are humble. We can say that all day long. But it's got to be a shift that takes place in your life. It's a lifestyle change. It's not a command you just listen to. It has to travel from your head. It's got to be more than intellect. It's got to be something that gets internalized. It's a shift. It is more than just saying it, but it is also living it. Now I know how this looks in my very... Pastor Darrell said, I have three kids and... And, and I prayed for my little girl. She's 14 now. Man, when she was little, she was the cutest thing. Now she's 14, going on 40. And mama is not having it in my house. Now, can I just tell you? But, but when I say humility is a choice, when my daughter chooses to be sassy, she can be sassy. It don't matter if we tell her, we're paying the mortgage, you live under our roof, you do this, you feed, we put clothes on your, we can say all we want. But if her mindset is to be sassy or rude or disrespectful, she will be. But oh, when she wants something, who's going to pay for my, pay for my volleyball lessons? Her mindset changes. It shifts. So it's a choice. What am I trying to tell you today? It's a choice we make to take on Christ's humility. And can I say, maybe, maybe here's a challenging question for you. Is, is there a relationship in your life right now that needs a mindset shift? Is there something going on in your world that needs a mindset shift? Where it's more than what you say, it is actually how you live. And you need to shift. So Paul says, it's an attitude of the heart. In verse 6, he says, he says, who being very nature God did not consider equality with God something to be used to, to take advantage of. Verse 7, it says, rather he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of of a servant being made in human likeness. This word, uh, uh, nature of God, it, the, the, the original language says he, he didn't just walk as this God man. There was not just him coming into the flesh. In Genesis, he was God. He was God before he became man. And so he carried this nature into his humanity. He was God 
before, and he did not consider equality with God something to use to advantage. He made himself nothing. The word here is he emptied himself. The picture is if you had a picture of liquid or a container with things that you were storing, if you imagine the liquid coming out of the container and every drop is poured out, this is the picture that we get. Jesus emptied himself. He poured out himself, taking on the nature of a servant, a bond servant. I've heard it said way back when when Pastor Darrell, um, I, I remember hearing a sermon. He said, Jesus did not use his deity to serve his humanity. And in turn, his humanity did not take anything away from his deity. Let me take, let me say that again. He didn't use his deity to serve his humanity and in turn his humanity did not take anything away from his deity. It's something that he chose. Matthew 26 and 53, when Jesus is get, or gets arrested, he, he says to those that arrest him, do you not think I can't call on my father and 12 legions of angels will come down? He made a choice. He made a choice. He, he made a choice to take off his eternal clothes and put on our earthly clothes and i'm not talking about clothes from macy's i'm talking about human skin so here's the illustration so jesus took off his glory and he put on our humanity all right are you with me all right. And you know, I asked the Lord about this illustration and he gave me the thumbs up. I was going to put that jacket back on, but I'm going to think otherwise. So he took off his eternal clothes. Can I get an amen if you were with me? And he put on his earthly clothes. John 1 and 14 says, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. But here's what happened. His, his glory was veiled outside. But even though I changed my jacket, my shirt did not change. And that's what happened with Jesus. Even though he changed, his glory didn't show outside. It didn't change who he was inside. So his glory was veiled outside, but he didn't lose his deity inside. And so when we imitate Christ's humility, I'm going to illustrate it. We take off this and we put on Jesus and we live a life here on earth. What is first Peter five and five? It says in the same way, you who are younger Submit yourselves to your elders. All of you clothe yourselves with humility toward one another because God opposes the proud but shows favor to the humble. This word clothe, it, it's an awesome word. It's a slave putting on an apron ready to serve. Just think about a slave, someone putting on an apron ready to serve. So, so I would ask you today, this morning, is, your, is there an area of your life that you need to put more of Jesus on? Is, is there an area of life that you need to put more of Jesus on? And can I challenge you? You should be willing to put it on all of your life, not just some of your life, because you can think, okay, well, well, this seems to be going well, and my finances are good over here, and, and this is good over here. No, Jesus wants you to cover it all with humility. So I submit my marriage to Jesus. I submit my finances to Jesus. I submit my decisions to Jesus. We serve one another in Jesus' name. It should be all of it. It's a choice. I could preach this all day long. You should, you would, you need to, you did. But you still have to go out and make the decision to put on Jesus. I can't do it for you. 
Pastor Darrell can't do it for you. Your brother or sister can't do it for you. You have to make the decision to put more of Jesus on in your life. Verse 8 says he was found in, in appearance as a man. He resembled every bit of a man. He humbled himself. He became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Even, even the cross was a choice. Now, now think about it. You're, if, if you're in the position of God, Jesus, the Holy Spirit, and you could come up with a plan to save the world, I don't know about you, I would pick the easiest route. That's right. That's right. Why I suffer? I own all the palaces, I own all the cities, all the animals, the cattle on a thousand hills belongs to me. Why would I pick the cross? Why, why would I even pick a virgin canal to come through? I could just show up and say, I'm Messiah. I could just show up. What is Paul trying to get us to look at? And the cross was not a coincidence. It was a choice. Jesus didn't just happen to show up on the scene and happen to pick the cross and happen to, to teach and happen to heal and happen to free and happen to feed. It was all planned. It's a choice. It's intentional. It's intentional. Amen. So Paul says in verse 9, if you continue with me. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on the earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Can I get an amen? amen. Last point, if you're taking line and online, I'm hoping you're seeing with us. Exaltation is the result of humiliation. There's a reason why I didn't use the word humility. In this case, humility seems to not measure up. Because we could look at verse 8 and say, he died on the cross, oh well, and move on. But you can't skirt past verse 8 to get to verse 9. He died on a cross, which was the most humiliating way to die. When Romans crucified men on the cross, they wanted it to be a public humiliation for the entire world to see. So even death on the cross could almost sound like, oh, well, he did die on the cross. I wear the cross. Jesus is a cross on my... No, it's much more than that. Jesus was humiliated. And he was not... <laughs> he was humiliated and sinless. Now, he wasn't hanging on the cross because of what he did wrong. He was hanging on the cross for us. So there's a question. When you think about humility, are you willing to be humble to the point of feeling humiliated? Now, this year marks the 23rd year my wife and I have been married. Praise God. All right? But it wasn't always easy. Now, Christians, and, and this is not an indictment against you guys, but, but in Christian marriages, we don't argue. We have strong fellowship. That's what we call it. Can I just say, sometimes you argue. Sometimes you fight. You don't always get along. And I'm not knocking my wife. God puts together personalities and differences like that. But, I mean, my wife is, is a strong personality. And I remember about four or five years into our marriage, 
we were having a strong fellowship quite a bit. And I would say, God, but I'm right, God. She's wrong. She should have never said it to me that way. That way. She's, she's right, but her approach is wrong. God took me to Ephesians 5. Love your wife like Christ loved the church and is willing to die for her. But I would say, God, I'm getting punked. I still have to apologize. I feel humiliated. But now, those are my anchor scriptures, Ephesians 5 and 1 Corinthians 13, unconditional love. But here's what I would say. It doesn't matter if you're married or not. If somebody walks into my office for a counseling appointment and they're like this and that or my wife or or whatever, my brother, my child or whatever the case may be, you know where I take them? I validate their offense. I say, I know you're hurt. I know this. I know that. I know that, this, that, and the other. But then I take them to the cross. And I remind them what Jesus was willing to do for you and I. He says, while we were yet sinners, he died. So while you were at the club, he died. While you were doing your other thing, he was dying. And then I realized that this humility that that I'm preaching today, we don't have the capacity to do it on our own. We need to reflect on something that gives us the capacity. I don't know how to be a godly husband or a godly dad or a pastor or, or a citizen in a community that's representing Jesus without Jesus. I don't have the capacity for unconditional love without the one who has unconditionally loved me. I don't know how to have the mindset of Jesus or to have his humility about, without the one that's been humbled for me. So if you're looking for a formula for Christ's humility in this world, you will not find it. Reflect on Jesus. Reflect on the cross. Verse 9, that's why he says, therefore God exalted him to the highest place. Why? Because he was willing to go to the lowest place. That's why. He exalted him to the highest place because he was willing to go to the, to the lowest place. And he gave him a name that is above every name. And, and here's the cool thing. When you think about humility of Jesus, do you notice God exalted him and gave him the name? So, so can I just say this? You don't have to exalt yourself or you don't have to give yourself a name. God will. God will exalt you. God will give you a name. I, I don't think God is looking at this church or another church and saying, oh, look at Calvary Chapel of the Palm Beaches. Five souls got saved. Good job. Calvary Chapel, good job. Ten. No. It says in due time, I will exalt you. I will give you a name. And, and really, the only name that matters is Jesus. First uh, Peter 5 and 6 says this, therefore humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time. I'm also reminded in Luke 10 when Jesus sends out the disciples to, to cast out demons, they, they come back, they're excited. Jesus, the demons are scared of us. Jesus says, don't rejoice that the demons are scared. Rejoice that your name is written in heaven. So Jesus is not outside measuring what church does what. what the most faithful church could be a 10-person church. He's not looking at size. He's not looking at personality. He's not looking at all of these things. He's looking for humility. And it says that the name, every knee should bow. Now, I think the NIV 
doesn't do it justice. Like should bow sounds like it's an option. Must bow. And, and it's having reverence for, for the person whose presence you are in. Now, I, there's times I, I don't always get a full night's sleep. And I don't know about you. Has the Lord ever woken you up in the morning and all you're trying to do is go back to sleep and you can't? And you may start walking around and praying. And, and there's times where, where God will bring me down to my knees. And I must bow. Why? Not because of what he has done, but because of who he is. Ever just bow because of who God is? Not because he's given you a job or a house or any material thing, but simply just because who he is. And you know why I bow also? Because he was willing to bow for me. You remember John 13? Jesus gathers his disciples around. And he washes their feet. He didn't do that standing up. Bowed, he got a, a basin, a towel. And he bowed. Now, now the thing that trips me out about that scene, I can't believe God himself, who was Jesus in human flesh, would wash our feet. This is God. And when you really grasp that, that God was willing to wash our feet. You bow willingly. It's not like you have a choice. It's not that God is forcing me to bow. But your reverence for God is so high. You can't do nothing else but bow. Can I say, sometimes I can't even stand up. I bow. Because I'm overwhelmed by the goodness of God. Every tongue will acknowledge, confess, publicly declare that Jesus is Lord. The word Lord is curios, one who has absolute ownership and uncontrolled power. That's the God we bow to. Isaiah 45, 23 says the same thing, which makes Jesus equal to God. And, and I would, I want to encourage you and, you know, I felt this conviction that the church over the last 16 to 17 months was really tested. The unity was tested. The humility was tested. We're dealing with a pandemic. No one saw that coming. God didn't send us a text beforehand. Hey, look, Politics wove its way into. Start talking about racial injustice. And people in the church began to cancel one another out based on diverse opinions. Now, can I say this? When you look around, you are not the same on purpose. This is a picture of heaven. And so if we don't know how to get along here, how can we get along there? And can I say, I, I challenged our church. We were, we were beginning to exalt these things as if they were equal to Jesus. They're not. No. No issue. There's only one name we exalt. There's only one name we bow to. His name is Jesus. And he's the only one that you're responsible for exalting. Can I just shout, if you're exalting politics or you're exalting an issue or you're exalting an ideology, Jesus has not asked you to exalt those things. Amen. Amen. 
He says to exalt him. John 12, 32 says when he's lifted up, all will be drawn to him. Not when your issue, not when an ideology, not when anything else is exalted, but when the name of Jesus is exalted. He is going to draw men to himself. And so Paul says to us, there will be a time coming where everyone in heaven, on earth, under the earth, will bow. Willingly or not. So people that don't want to bow now will eventually. So I say this. Why wait till then to bow? Bow now. Not when you, I mean, who wants to be forced to bow? And why do we bow now? Paul says at the end, it's for the glory of God. Why do we want to imitate Christ's humility? It's for the glory of God. It has nothing to do with you or I. It's not about me. It's not about you. It's a choice that we make. We choose to put on Jesus. And can I say this? This is not just a church feel good right now when the service is over. Speak this into your afternoon. Speak this into your Monday. Into every area of your life. Make a choice. And then at the end, you know, I'm exaltation is a result of humiliation i I would say sometimes you're going to humble yourself so much that you feel humiliated but you remember it's for the glory of god and you look at the cross and you say because he was willing to be humiliated for me i'm going to be willing to be humiliated for him Amen? amen let's bow our heads and pray jesus We humble ourselves and we say, have your way. God, it does not matter how long we have been walking with you. I'm sure there's always a deeper level of which we can be humbled. And so Holy Spirit, remove the shame, remove the guilt, Remove anything that would hinder this moment where your Holy Spirit desires a response. It's the altar where we become living sacrifices. We go, Holy Spirit, we pray for you to move. And it's in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to just say this before we close. This is the most important part of the service. You know, we sometimes, you know, when when we share, we we want to invite people into to new relationships with Jesus, and, and that's good. Like some of you don't have a relationship with Jesus. Or some of you have been walking as if you're in a relationship with Jesus, but it's, it needs to go deeper. And so if you're saying that's me, Jesus, I want to, I want to walk with you. We're just going to ask you to stand. Just stand where you are. But maybe, maybe you're at a place where you need restoration. You need reconciliation with Jesus. Or you may come to this place where you say, man, that message spoke. Lord, would you humble me today? And you stand to your feet. Now, I can make it easy and make you raise your hand. I I could say walk up front, which tends to be intimidating. So to me, here's the Holy Spirit meeting you in the middle. I'm not asking you to walk up. 
I'm not asking you to put your hand up, but I'm asking you to take a step of faith and stand to your feet. And you're not standing for me. You're standing for Jesus. And you're asking him to help you, to help you walk in this area of humility, which he's called you to. And so your standing to your feet is agreeing with what the Holy Spirit already desires to do in you this morning. Can I say this? Before I even preached the message, the Holy Spirit knew you were going to be standing. And so let's praise God for the response in which the Holy Spirit brought to an advance. So, so worship team, if you could just play a few chords over. I want you to go to Jesus directly and in the quietness of your own heart God you say God humble me in this area and you begin to call out those things that he wants to do in you and then at the end I will pray after a few minutes in which the Holy Spirit gets to connect with you I will pray to close out this time worship team would you leave Spirit, although we are standing, in heart we are bowing. We bow before the King. And God, I pray that those standing, you would honor every part of their heart. God, it may be a struggle right now for them to, to move from point A to point B. And we ask you, Holy Spirit, would you be an encourager? Would you give them strength, God? Even when they think that they're failing, Holy Spirit, would you come alongside them and give them strength? We thank you, God, that we can willingly bow. Not to any Lord, but the Lord of Lords. Not to any King, but King of Kings. Not to any name, but the name that is above every name. And at the name of Jesus, every knee must and will bow, and every tongue will confess that you are Lord. To the glory of God our Father. And I pray this, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Would you give yourselves a hand as you respond to God? Once again, it's all about Jesus. Can we all stand, please? See, our job as a church, our job as pastors and elders and ministers, is first of all to continue to bring ourselves before the throne of grace 
because it's at the throne of grace that we receive power, power to live lives that are worthy of the call in which we have received. But it's also there that we receive power to help bring others to the throne of grace. I looked out just now and I saw Pastor Sean sitting back there. Pastor Sean was called out this morning. Some of you know that he's a, a chaplain and he got a call that somebody had committed suicide. And so he had to run and go tell the family, minister to the family. It's the only way you can minister to that family is you have to go through the throne of grace. So you have to go through the throne of grace to get grace, to give grace. And so when we come to the house of the Lord, that's our purpose for us all to come before the throne of grace so that we can empty ourselves, so that we can be filled, so that we can go and minister to others. Because everybody ought to know who Jesus is. Amen. So I thank you all for coming out today. For those of you who've been watching us online, thank you again for tuning in. I pray that you would continue to pray for us and that you would hit that share button, hit that like button. Again, thank you. Let's pray. Father, again, thank you for uh, Pastor Dwayne coming out, Lord. Continue to encourage him, oh God, to do the things that you've called for him to do, oh God. May he continue, Father, to uh, submit himself mm, in the bow, gleefully, joyfully before you, oh God. And we pray, Lord, that what we heard today as a church, what we heard as a congregation, Father, Lord, would swell up in our hearts, oh God. That it would swell up in our hearts, oh God, that we can share the good news with others, oh God. Again, we look to you as the author and the finisher of our faith. We thank you, Lord, that you never leave us, you never, never forsake us, but you're always with us, even to the end of the age. In Jesus' mighty name we pray, amen. God bless you. Have a wonderful day. God bless you.